Council Stop Tour of Level Crossing Management in Irish Rail, this particular presentation was designed for our technical staff, new entrants and graduate engineers. So there's a lot of content in it, but I'm going to breeze over a lot of it, concentrate on the photographs. Um, if anyone has any further questions to ask, we'll do it at the end of the session. And also I'll make it available as a PDF so they can really delve deep into the information that's included in this. But um, just to start off, um, Irish Rail, the railway network is largely rural in nature and consequently is categorised by a large number of level crossings. Um, we manage these level crossings through three, three divisions. We've at Lone Division, Dublin Division and Limerick Junction. I work in at Lone Division, which is over on the West Coast. Uh, Aaron Rodair and Irish Rail has a chief engineer and under the chief civil, en chief civil engineer, we have three infrastructure managers. We have three senior track and structure engineers. We have three chief permanent way inspectors. We have 25 permanent way inspectors. We have a new projects team made up of engineers, technical staff and per way staff. Our gauge is 1600 millimetres, our five foot three inches, and we have six foot between our double track. So um, it's it's similar to in, as in Northern Ireland and Australia and Brazil, and it's predominantly made up of 54 kg rail. Um, you can just see the northern half, northern top of the country, that's looked after by Translink Northern Ireland Railways. Um, in 1999, uh, an Irish Rail project team was set up to implement rec the recommendations of an AD Little report. The, um, the Level Crossings programme was established with a mandate to enhance safety through the upgrade or removal of level crossings across the network. At the outset of the railway safety programme, there were in excess of two, uh, 2,500 level crossings across all lines, over 2,000 on used lines and 1,600 on passenger lines. There are in total approximately 2,165 kilometres of passenger line on our network. This corresponds to an average of one level crossing per kilometre of passenger line. Um, by the end of 2022, uh, 1,611 crossings <clears throat> have been removed from the network as part of our level crossings programmes. And this has been done through land acquisition and the construction of physical infrastructure such as roads and bridges to facilitate the removal of the level crossing. And just that map on the left hand side shows you yeah, the rail network coverage of the population density. Um, just an introduction and an overview of level crossings. User worked uh, on attended level crossings. Um, a level cro I'm going to just basically what it is, it's, it's a level crossing which provides access between premises and a public highway or between land or lands and premises under common ownership and occupation, but divided by the railway lines. For example, where a railway and a road crosses on the same level or where a farmer can cross between fields on each side of the railway line. The gates are operated by the level crossing user. We have um, four main types of user on attended level crossings. So we have F type, P type, O type and O P type. And I just go show you pictures of them rather than going through the, the text there. Um, this is our most common type. It's an F type, a field to field level crossing. Um, they're galvanised tubular steel post and rail with Allen key clamps. Fencing is what we try to use where possible. So we fence out from our boundary out to the anti-trespass straw cattle grids and uh, they're predominantly uh, double hasp heavy duty gates that are used. And um, that's a typical uh, signage on the left hand side up here. And on approach to uh, these level crossings, we've whistleboards. Now we only use the whistleboard where we have restricted views. Um, uh, we, where we can't provide the user with the with the, the minimum sight and distance. Then we have our pedestrian type of level crossing. Uh, it's normally a, a wicket gate or a swing gate or a style. Um, we demarcate the, the ground two metres back from the running edge. So the user, once he's outside or she's outside the yellow box, they're in a position of safety if a train is to approach. We have an O type level crossing. These are a public road. This is a, 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 a on a private road, so it might be just into a residence or one or two houses or or um, a small industrial park, or whatever. So these are our typical signage. Again, obviously, being in Ireland at public roads, we have to display both the English sign, English translation, and the Irish translation. So we have to double up on our signs. Um, at all our O and O P type level crossings, we have. Uh, uh, whistleboard on both approaches, regardless if the views are available or not. This is just as an additional um, safety um, for uh, unfamiliar users and um, unfamiliar visitors with the level crossing. 
we try at these type of level crossing, we have um, we use a concrete post and wire fence. This is in the event of a, if there's an accident at the level crossing and there's a car strikes the, 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 the um, fencing that the, the rebar in the concrete post will stop it from being projected through the air. It'll just break, snap, bend in half and stay on site. Um, our public road level crossing is very similar to our road type level crossings. Um, we, again, we have our whistle boards on all of these approaches. We use white stop lines so the users know where to stop and advance the level crossing. I'll discuss that further on in the presentation. The additional at our public roads level crossings is our local authorities are, are responsible for the advance warning signs. So we would have a typical sign like this, uh, one at 300 metres, 200 metres and 100 metres in advance of both approaches. And these again are our highest risk crossing types. This is where you have the most unfamiliar, familiar user mix of ranges. You could have um, kids, buses, all that using these types of level crossings. But then we also have manned level crossings. And this is a level crossing that's operated and supervised by a railway employee. So we have different types there. We have C type, CCTV, OPSs and manual barriers. Uh, this is again is a typical C type level crossing. Uh, you can see the the barrier here <coughs> is closes the railway off normally. When a train approaches, then it closes the public road off. This is the, the gatekeeper's cottage here. Again, we have our local authority advance warning signs. In this particular location, it's in an urban environment, so we have added um, hatch lines, yellow hatch lines, to the road surface to keep it clear in the event that the crossing keeper tries to close the gates. Um, we also have an OPS type a gated cross. This is an iron gate level crossing with an interlocked signal. So there's an interlocking key here when the gate is closed over. The key is locked in and it, it, it allows the safe passage of trains. Um, our, again, our, our most common CCTV type level crossing on all our national primary routes. We used to have automatic barriers, AHBs, but we've got rid of those due to incidents with zigzagging the gates and stuff like that. So we use full barrier for barrier crossings um, these are uh, these again will have the local authority advance warning signs the countdown markers we have um, road traffic lights each one with a yellow light and two red flashing lights we have audible warnings which stops when the train but when the barriers are lowered we'd have four lifting barriers each fitted with two red boom lights and skirts we have four barrier machines and we have signals provided on either side, normally at 200 metres in the event that there's an incident at the level crossing, we can stop the train in advance. There's four public telephones there for members of the public to use to control, to contact the level crossing control centre. And we have cameras, obviously feeding back to the level con crossing control centre. We have two cameras at each location and um, they're known as camera one and two and one is in use and one is for backup and the cameras are alternatively switched over each day. Um, and then we have overhead lighting, uh, two lights, one on each side of the crossing to provide illumination during the hours of darkness. Um, we have uh, some automatic level crossings. We have lights and bells. We have miniature warning lights. We have barrier level crossings. We have barrel crossings and we've open crossing an OC type. Again, a lot of people will be familiar with these, but just to show you an OC type crossing, we only have, I think, two of these on the network and they're used down at Wexford Quay, which they uh, go into a level cross or into a car park, a public car park there. You can just see the, the water in the background. And again, we would have our whistle boards, boards on both approaches to these for the train drivers to sound to alert the members of their approach. Um, where we've regulator and an accident investigation. So the uh, Railway Accident Investigation Unit, the RAIU, is the, an independent railway uh, accident investigation organisation for Ireland, and they're concerned with the investigation of accidents and incidents on the national railway network, the DART, which is our electrified section of the railway, the Lewis, and any in industrial railways and heritage railways. And in addition to that too, we have the, the CRR, our commissioner, and again, they're an independent regulatory body which reports to the Minister for Transport. Um, the Commission has a, a number of major roles and they're the, with the National Safety Authority charged with oversight of safety of heavy and light railway organisations operating in the state and the, with the associated uh, infrastructure. The regulatory body ensuring non-discriminatory access to heavy rail market within the state. Um, so again, that, that's their, their two of our governing bodies.
my laptop has given up the ghost here. Can you, are you still seeing the regulator and accident investigation? Yeah. It's stuck on that, is it? Yeah. Bear with me here now, I'll just have to escape this. Reason it's not. Ah, it's yeah. moving on here again. Sorry about that. Um, just some uh, quick again, level crossing accident statistics. Thankfully, the, the trend in Ireland has been reducing. Um, again, we, uh, the, some of the figures may be skewed by the, the two years where we were in lockdown as well. So the, the usage, of course, um, was a lot lower. But um, just, just to show you some there, this is load uh, level crossing road vehicles and near misses. Uh, the, the the near misses and trends again have have been reduced reducing, which is all positive. Again, this is this is we won't just blame um, COVID. We have been doing an awful lot of work, pub, um, uh, publicity and safety awarenesses around our level crossing. So hopefully that's all um, feeding into these positive results. Um, that one seems to be right, and the chart shows the level crossing incidents relating to pedestrian errors are near misses. There's sort of no clear, clear trend on these since 2018 or 2014. Um, so then again, as I said, the trend has been uh, we we haven't we haven't had any collisions since 2016, um, and we've had no pedestrians struck by a, a train at a level crossing since. Again, this is just one that we throw in there. This is why level crossing gates exist at level crossings. And I just one of the earliest photographs I came across was there in 1953. You can see a, like a Model T Ford in front of a, a steam engine. Uh, that was the last incident that we had on our network in 2020. These were all at user worked crossings. Thankfully, there's only one fatality in that photograph, which was this particular one. But everybody else walked away from the rest of these. Um, these are our CCTV crossing um, barrier strikes. Unfortunately, looking at those photographs, you can see that they're all professional drivers. They're all either agricultural or they're truck drivers and stuff like that. So again, it's a it's an ongoing issue, but we are we are looking at uh, red light cameras and further uh, publicity and um, campaigns and um, targeting these particular this audience and these users. Um, we have level crossing control centres that monitor all our CCTV level crossings. We've got three of them currently and we have a new national one opening up shortly, I think towards the end of this year up in Houston Station in Dublin. But this is just an example of the Athlone one where they have the capacity to operate 96 level crossings. And they're the lines that they operate out of Athlone. And uh, there's, there's five operators in each of these and each operator has five stations. And they would look after the level cross through the monitors and through their control panels below them. Um, we have a technical management standard CCE TMS 380. This this outlines all our our uh, guidelines and regulation around our level crossings. Um, we also have a level crossing risk model. So uh, we invest a lot of importance in identifying and managing the and responding to risk at level crossings. So we um, we operate a, a level crossing risk model and um, it evaluates the risk at each level crossing on the entire network based on 100 and in, uh, 140 individual inputs for every level crossing. This information is collected on an annual basis based on inspections, technical service, traffic counts and a suite of evaluation measures which are inputted to um, der derive uh, risk to road users and to railway users. And while the, the risk profile is constantly evolving to changes to traffic volumes or train frequency. It, it means that we can prioritize and constantly evolve and address those highest risk areas first. But that's just a, a, a sort of a, showing you the, the output screens at the end of the exercise, showing you where the ratings are and some of the risk drivers that are causing the, the higher risk, say if it is a, an intolerable level crossing. So we can, we can delve into this and look at areas that are under our control where we can reduce the risk and hopefully bring it back to a tolerable level. Um, 
measure of use at all our level crossings. Obviously, we have a minimum sight and distance to achieve. That's all based on the line speed for the individual level crossing. So this is just the method we use where basically we use a target goes out past, in this case, a curve. We stop the guy holding it, tell him to walk back until we can see the full 600 by 600 mil panel. We measure the views 3.66 meters back from the rail and 1.22 above ground level. That, that represents a car driver, the lowest users at our level crossing. And we, we, we use a laser then to, to record the distance they are away from the level crossing. That's a for double track and that's single track. Um, again, we, we have to be aware of all the, the different types of level crossing users that use our level crossing. So they're just a range of them. And um, that's actually set at the 1.22 meters above ground level. So we can just get a comparison, say a four wheel drive Jeep, an ATV, a van driver, a small panel van, a tractor driver, car driver, uh, some of the vulnerable users. Um, so we, we would have measured all these at the different types of level crossings just to get a, a good a good handle on them um, and keeping the, the sight and distance achievable for that particular type of user. Um, we've looked at all the different vehicles, as I said, they're high roof, low roof um, Jeeps. Um, some of the enhancements that we've done at our level crossings is one of them is v, uh, vegetation boards, V boards, as you can see, we've a, it's a simple board with a V on it. There's four of these at each level crossing. There's two on each approach. They're, um, they're installed at the minimum sight and distance away from the level crossing. <clears throat> All the four boards face towards the crossing. And these boards are basically for our patrol gangers who walk the track every Monday, our permanent way inspectors and our technical engineering staff. So any, any member of the staff that are at a level crossing, they can step 12 foot back from the rail. They can look to their left and look to their right. And if they can clearly see the V boards, there's no issue with their with the views. They can cross the side, the opposite side of the track and do the similar. If there's anything then blocking our, our the views, we, we will create a notification to have that addressed as soon as possible. And also it's a it's a it's a, a mark and stick for our um contractors who carry out our vegetation control with uh, with their uh, on track machines. So they, they know when they get as far as the V board that they've cut the minimum uh, distance. What we were finding before the installation of these V boards that Sometimes if they were required to cut, say, 400 metres, they may cut 500 metres or may only cut 300 metres. They hadn't got a, 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 um, an odometer reading on their cab that was accurate enough. So we, we sometimes we go back, check the work the day after and have to get the contractor back again to cut maybe an extra 50 metres. So these V-boards have helped with that. And also our staff on the ground now have a, a defined tool to use to, to make sure the views are compliant. Um, other enhancements we use is the anti-trespass guards are, are categories as we call them. Um, we're looking at sustainable materials. We we have been using timber a lot, but the timber we're getting on average a, a five year lifespan on these. They can they they can break when a, a, a an RRV gets on and off at a particular level crossing if they don't mount the rails correctly. So we looked at things like rubber pyramids. These are recycled rubber and um, they're, they're lightweight, they're separate panels. The panels are about two metres by one metre wide. They're easily uh, lifted in and out by our staff. Um, if an RV drives over, they'll just deform and pop back into shape again. If, if any of our staff was to slip, trip or fall on them, they're rubber again. It's a soft kind of landing. We've also incorporated some steps here so you can hold on to the handrail and step across the, the mats if you're, wa if you're gaining access to our cess. And then we've used a recycled plastic type. These are just made out of 100% recycled plastic. They replicate the timber. But again, we found that they can, um, they, they'll outlast uh, timber by up to 40 years. Uh, you can drive across them. They're very robust materials. Um, other enhancements with use of MERS. One of the issues we've discovered at our skew type level crossings, especially uh, an acute skew, is that a panel va van driver has a very restricted view. So here, this particular level crossing, you only had about 45 meters of a view. So if there was trains approaching, your, your, your reaction time is greatly reduced. So we looked at installing mirrors at these particular type of level crossings. We went to our Nordic friends to have a look at what they use, and they use what's known as a, a durable ice-free stainless steel traffic mirror. So there's actually a thermo gel on the back of this, 
mirror that uh, regulates the temperature and all it needs is two or three uh, degrees change in temperature over the course of the day and as a, the evening cools that that two or three degrees will, will stop dew building up in it and um, frost so you can see the top one here has no gel the bottom one has so we're, we're locating these at any of our skew type level crossings or this particular example on the bottom this is in a tight cutting where the user had to go produce had to his vehicle or his tractor in this case would have been out in, in infringing the gauge before he could clearly see to his left or his right. So we have a mirror installed either side staggered so that they're not blocking each other. And you can just see on this one on the left, the mirror, it's picking up the, the train approaching from the right hand side here, the headlights. Um, again, it's just showing you an example of a skew type level crossing. Obviously at a CCTV type level crossing, there's no need for mirrors. It's all protected by barriers. And this is a user work level crossing. So you have a mirror located on either side. So this guy, when he's traveling up here, he will look to the mirror in front of him and he's, it's angled to pick the trains approaching in the down direction. And again, if you're coming from this side, you have the mirror looking for. Mm. Gates at level crossings is very important. Uh, we have settled on this type of gate here. You actually have to, uh, the keyhole is upside down. So uh, in order to close or open this gate, you have to turn the handle through um, 180 degrees feeds this part through it. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, again, it's a heavy duty galvanized gate. Originally our, our, our standard gate used to be nine foot, but with the, 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 with modern machinery and farming practices, our gates now are going from 12 and even 14 foot. And in some cases for combine harvesters, we've gone to 16 foot gates. Um, Passive signage is very important. This is this is how we communicate with all our users and how we uh, um, explain to them to cross safely. And um, they were all designed with the human factor principle behavior um, to gain their attention and to deliver a clear message. They're red um, for uh, their mandatory signs. Also the red, um, obviously in Ireland, we're very green. We have a lot of green uh, foliage and land. So the red po uh, pops out at you on a green background. So they're just a few examples. That's our pedestrian cross and um, cyclist dismount. Uh, we put we place stop signs on our gate because we're hoping that when you get there first and foremost that this gate is closed and the stop sign will it will especially at night time will, will um, reflect in, in the headlights of the car so you don't drive through the gate. Then if that gate is left in the open position, that stop sign is normally going to be facing against a hedgerow or a wall. The pole mounted stop sign takes over then. But what we were noticing with our stop signs, gate mounted ones, that they were wind loading and they were um, blowing the gates open in some instances. And sometimes cars could be driving through the crossing and the, the gate could be blown against it, causing some damage. So we, we perforated the sign. So that's what that one looks like there. It's got a load of holes and it's so allowed wind to pass through. This is a typical farmer's cross in here where we have our stop sign pole mounted again, relative um, appropriate signs. Um, at all our level crossings, we look at the surface and the stop line. So at our public road level crossings, we have stone mastic asphalt, it's a sealed surface. And um, at our farmer's crossings, we tend to have a, a rolled, um, uh, it was 804 surface. So what we do where we have uh, sealed surfaces, we'll, we'll paint on the white stop lines and stop. Or in this instance, we'll use a two third, one third continuous white line broken in. Uh, obviously, a, sorry, a continuous white line means it's a one way street. This isn't, we can pass over either way. So two thirds, one third is a 300 mil wide line. So what this does is it gives the members of the public um, the confidence to stop behind the white line and know that they're in a position of safety. Also, it helps our train drivers when they're passing to see if they need to apply an emergency brake or not. Before we installed these, we had a lot of near misses and a lot of them were false near misses because when we investigated into them, the, 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 the car driver was in a position of safety, but the train driver panicked, I suppose, or just wasn't sure. So since we introduced these lines, we've greatly reduced the near misses. And when we have a near miss now, it actually is a near miss. Um, where we cannot apply white lines on a, on a non-sealed surface, we erect these um, black and yellow um, markers two meters back from the running edge. So the, the, the crossing user is instructed to stop behind these. And again, they'll be in a position of safety. Uh, for cyclists, we had problems again at some of our really acute skew level crossings where we had a lot of cyclists um, accidents at, at this particular crossing. 
a lot of collarbones broken and stuff like that. We, we, we have signage up in advance to dismount, but unfortunately a lot of the cyclists ignore this. And because of the tight angle, their front wheel gets caught on the rail and they inevitably they're, they're, they're thrown off their bike. So we looked at this jug handle design, we incorporated it into it. What we discovered was that at an angle of between 60 and 90 degrees is the optimum angle for, for cyclists traversing the rail. So we're bringing them in here, encouraging them to come across a 60 degrees turn and head off again. So again, we haven't, since we've implemented this, we, we've had a good, um, we've had reduced in, in accidents and um, it, it seems to be working very well and a lot of the cyclists seem to be obeying it. So, um, Engagement and enforcement, we try to engage obviously with all our level crossing users. The last thing we want to do is in, enforcement, but engagement. So we just had, there's a selection of our um, booklets that we have done and we have them just, uh, they're like a, an, a, an A4 sheet folded over into, into quarters, uh, just small booklet it deals with the particular level cross and you're 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 dealing with rather than one book do all and, and have too much information we just deal with the type of user and the type of crossing uh, so here's uh just the booklet that we would hand out we, we we have regular awareness days at level crossings we would have leaflet drops we we deal with the irish police the on garda siakana uh, we do with the with their community engagement garda we have public awareness campaigns we get active with ilcad day every june um, we have presentation days to key stakeholders and we have ongoing engagement with our media and we deal with our, our road safety authority too as well. Um, we use a, an app on our phone. This is part of our asset management system. It's a field reach mobile app. Uh, it resides in our handheld mobile device. In our, our case, we have iPhones that we use. Um, we carry out annual and three yearly inspection. The annual are carried out at our O&OP type, our busiest type of level crossings, where the three yearly inspections generally be our field to field level crossings. But we carry out um, our uh, work through these apps. So there's a notification, there's a work order created to tell you you have to go out there on a certain date. You get out on site, you open up your notification and you carry out the works. And from this, we can, if there's any repair works that need to be done, we can create the relevant notification and we have a, a system of finders and fixers. I'm a finder. I go out and find the issues. We have the budget holder who's the fixer and he will fix the problems. And we have finder fixer meetings where we'll agree on the work when it has to be done, time scales, prioritize and stuff like that. Uh, other new technologies we're using is a VAMIS uh, system. It's a decision support tool. It uh, has an audible warning system and has a two aspect color light traffic light so you can just see it here uh, we have an orange and a red light our regulator didn't want to uh, give a, a green light uh, the, the theory behind that is the only one that gets a green light on the railway is a train so the members of the public get a red when a train is approaching an audible warning and a yellow uh, when 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 there's no trains approaching so you just cross a caution it's a treadle system that's uh, put out at the relevant distance for the speed of that particular level crossing. So it's a strike in, strike out treadle that sends a message back to here. And as I said, it goes from amber to red in an audible warning. Once the train passes, the audible warning goes off and it resets back to amber. We have two types of these as well. We've an always on and a, a, an on demand. So the always on is at our public road level crossings, which means the user has nothing to do. They just arrive at the level crossing and um, depending on which light they have, the light across or wait until the train passes. The on-demand is used at more rural locations where we wouldn't have a, the, it might be a seasonal used crossing by a farmer. So they basically come in, open the gate, press the button, it activates the, the system, they'll either get an, amb or an orange or a red, and that'll time delay, times out after five minutes. And again, when they come back to the crossing, they just press the button again. But again, this would all be done with a risk assessment on the ground and that the, the, the users would be um, briefed on how to use this correctly and all that. And the signage again would explain this on site. Um, this is just uh, regarding the VAMIS decision support tool. We, on average, to build a public road bridge uh, has been working out in the region of two million euro. That's to buy the appropriate land and all the works that's associated with it. Uh, to put in a full barrier CCTV level cross and it can work out between 1.2 and 1.5 million. So our, this decision support system, where we couldn't, we can install it for in around 110,000 euro per unit per level crossing. 
So uh, therefore, the cost of the decision support system is a, is a factor of 10 to 20 times less than that of a barrier level crossing or an underbridge or an overbridge. So the net reduction in risk that can be achieved from this. So we can we can get 10 up to 20 of these new light systems to far out is the risk reduction that would be achieved from a provision of a bridge or full barriers at one single level crossing. So it's a it's imperative that we demonstrate value for money for the limited funds that are, we receive and to achieve a more total reduc risk reduction than it can across the, the network. Um, level crossing eliminations, it's our policy to close level crossings where pro practical and possible and to resist the introduction of new level crossings. When it becomes known that a land on both sides of the level crossing are no longer in common ownership, i.e. consult with CIE group property, and um, if their search is revealed split ownership, the level crossing should be closed up where it's possible to reach an agreement with a level crossing user to close a level crossing. We'll instruct our group solicitor and get and seek board approval. A legal agreement must be drawn up by the group solicitor and the level crossing will be extinguished. Um, other alternatives to remove a user work to level crossing are to upgrade to full barrier CCTV or replace it with either a precast overbridge or an underbridge. Uh, this is just to conclude then in a quick summary. Uh, the safe management of level crossings is essential to our safe management of the network. The new traffic light decision support systems, the DSS for roads users, are a key component of our strategy. The DSS are to date proving to be an important part of our overall risk management strategies for our level crossings. Level crossing eliminations continue to be part of the overall strategy, continue to maintain signage views and surfaces through ongoing inspections and to continue to work with all stakeholders on safe use of level crossings through positive engagement and enforcement. As I said, that was a whistle stop tour of what we do. There's lots and lots more information there. If you have any questions, that's my email address. Feel free to email me directly or through um, the, the PWI and I hopefully be able to answer your questions. As I said, I can make the, this presentation available as a PDF as well. So anyone that wants it is more than welcome. I'll stop sharing my screen here now. Sorry, Andy, you're on mute there. We can't hear you, Andy. Can you hear me? I can hear, yeah, yeah, I can yeah. hear you now. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's too many mute buttons. So, um, so to open to the audience. So, if there's any questions, then put them in the chat, and we'll have a a discussion. So, um, um, yep. Yeah. So uh, we have Fall Bachar. I hope I've pronounced that right. So, can we have a copy of the presentation? I think Frank, you've already said that's fine as well. Yeah, so, no yeah. Um, I've got a question myself. Um, in Ireland, is the the um, I imagine we, we talked very briefly at the beginning about the, the legal status in the UK. We have a lot of problems closing crossings on the mainland um, because th there's a lot of groups who are resistant to closing crossings. Um, so we get quite a lot of opposition from ramblers groups and all sorts of things. Is that the case in Ireland as well? Yeah, um, I suppose out of all the level crossings we've closed, it's all we call it the low hanging fruit, the, the, the ones that have been relatively straightforward where you might have only one one or two users using the locations and it was easy to buy out. The, the public roads become very difficult because you do, you have all these different groups of people. Um, nine times out of 10, if you're, re, if you're replacing it with an overbridge or an underbridge, it tends to be run more smoothly, but an all out closure where you're not replacing them, you're not giving them an alternative. That's where you run into difficulties. But nine times out of 10, there will be an alternative. We may um, create a road up to uh, a next, a, 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 the next level crossing, which may be a safer le level crossing, have better views and stuff like that. So if you give them an alternative, not nine times out of 10, you, you'll get it over the line. Hmm. Right, thank you. Right. So, um... We've got a few more questions now. So Frank, um, sorry, Mike Bruder says, thanks, Frank. Very interesting with some difficult, different ways of looking at things. I like the terminology use pitched at the worker rather than management speak. So a thumbs up there. Um, Thomas, Kennedy, for CCTV crossings, is there a separate train detection circuit to inform controllers of approaching trains? There is. Yeah. Um, they Again, this isn't my 
area of expertise. But to answer your question, there is. If you would like further detail on it, I can I can definitely put them in contact with the right people. I, I don't want to sort of talk about something that I'm not 100 percent or fail it. OK, we, we can do that. There's certainly I think I've certainly learned a lot today as well, even if only that red and yellow signs are much clearer to read than the ones we use. So. Right, Ian Carling said you're looking at red light violation or obstacle detection. Where do you feel this technology lies and gates? Have you considered monitoring these? We have. Um, we're looking. We're 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 we, we're looking at. I suppose we're looking at red light monitoring. We're looking at. Uh, maybe we're talking about two different things here. I know at our CCTV barrier level crossings, we've a lot of red light red light running, where people are trying to race the the barriers, and we're we're currently working with Angarda Shiakana and Irish Police on installing red light running cameras at these locations. This is where um, they will take full control and, and prosecute the, the the offenders that they catch. Obviously, we don't have any legal um, right to do that or, or access to the, even the information of regist car registration, especially with GDPR guidelines and all that. Um, that answer the question, or am I? Do you, do you want to uh, uh, unmute yourself, Ian, and ask? Yeah, so, hello, Frank. Uh, Ian, Carlin. Ian. Yeah. Yeah, so, so obviously, certainly over in the, in the UK, over here, we have uh, most of them, or a lot of the crossings, have a red light violation system on them, or an obstacle, you know, combined with an obstacle detection system as well. Um, a, firstly, to aid prosecution. Obviously, the main thing is to keep it safe so there's nothing within that boundary of the level crossing. So, I mean, is that, that was one of you looked at, you know, and you probably give me a good answer on that or an answer. Yeah, we, we did. We, we did. Ian, we looked at it and we we compared and contrasted. And I suppose when it came down to our risk assessment, the DSS, the decision support tool, the the lights, the VAMIS lights, standalone system on its own, I suppose ticked all the boxes at the time from our from our safety point of view. So we we looked at incorporation in a vehicle detection system and all that. But this was kind of uh, step one, I suppose, see how successful we are with the DSS. So we're currently rolling them out. We're probably, I think we're in, we're probably starting year three of the program. So we have 16 of them currently in place and up and running. So it, we're, we're looking back, we're looking at the, uh, we're looking at near misses or any incidents at these level crossings. And so, so, uh, so any of them that we've been, installed so far we've had no near misses and we've had no accidents so we haven't been forced yet to go down the road of our detection vehicle detection um system yet if that answers your question Ian. no that that's great frank and then if i may without hogging it uh, the, the second part of that was gates you've always done so much work I, I love a bit about the uh the bicycle going over and and you know changing the angle it was something it, it's it's a cracking idea. It's simple, but probably very effective. It's simple, yeah. And again, if you've got the space to do that, we were fortunate enough. Our boundaries were wide enough that we were able to um, move our 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 cattle grid fencing, we call it, to incorporate that just extra bit of uh, space we needed. But it wasn't a lot. You were only looking at maybe an extra half a meter of moving the fence to mm. allow us to 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 it. And and it's been very successful because this was an, an accident black spot for cyclists. And yeah. to be fair, since we installed it, we haven't had any report of any injuries at this location. Yeah. So we're just on the gates then. And again, I apologise to the guys on the call. Um, are there other 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 locations where you would maybe benefit from knowing that somebody had accessed a gate, but maybe not got to the other side, or that gate had been left open? Is that something that you've looked at? Does it does it apply really? It does. Well, a lot of our gates, unfortunately, our public road level crossings, we've an awful problem with the user leaving the gates open. The first guy or lady over in the morning opens the gate, in some cases tie them open and leave them open because they just can't be bothered getting out and open and closing the gates. So where we would have a problem from what you're saying Ian, is where where we would encourage the user, say a farmer who's going to bring a low, slow, slow, low slung vehicle or he's going to bring a herd of animals across where he rings the signal man and he says, look, I'm, is it OK, first of all, to bring this animal or equipment over? And the signal man will say either yeah or nay. And he, if he says, yeah, he says, you ring me back after you've made the crossing and where the user forgets to ring back. That's when we have an issue. So we have to caution all the trains 
in that general area until we get somebody out or we make contract with the user again to say that he's cleared the line safely and he's gone about his business. So that's that's where we would mostly have it. Again, obviously, our train drivers will report uh, gates open as part of their um, uh, the journey reports and stuff like that. And we, we, we do collect all that. Or, and if there's somebody in the area again, we'll, they'll be sent out to close the gates, especially if they notice, say, any children in the area or maybe some loose animals or something that uh, cause, you know, raise their concern. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Frank. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Joan, did you have a question? Joan Harry? Hi Andy, I do have a question, but I can see that Mr Hill and Mr Ross know far more about level crossings than I do. So let them go first and if there's time, then okay. I'll go with my question. Right, so Rich, Richard Hill says, is the risk assessment annual for every type of crossing? Not, not for every type of level crossing. We, we risk assess all our level crossings, but basically our public road level crossings, which would be our O's and our OP's, they are risk assessed annually every 12 months. All other crossings tend to be pushed out to 36 months every three years. Now, again, we, there are some level crossings where we've risk assessed it, where we will re, um, assess them every 24 months. But again, it's a risk assessment that's carried out. OK, and Ian Ross asks, over what period did the closure of the 1,611 level crossings take place? And what was the cost of delivering this and how did you fund it? So, um, we started in 1997, so that's how many years ago now we're uh, 97 2007 17 or 20 26 years is it over 26 years um I, I i don't have the the cost of to hand but i know that there is a cost in, available i could i could probably get access to that information um there was there was i suppose there was irish government money there was european union money there was um I, we, we, anywhere we could get the money from our hand was out our, our board would look for for it but um yeah there what there was um there was a lot of money invested in as particularly in the last 10 or 15 years in the railway through european funding that and, and a lot of that was was used to to help close these level crossings they are our highest risk asset so anytime we went for board approval it was a no-brainer if we can close a level crossing the only safe level crossing is a closed level crossing mm. Right, any more questions? Can I ask mine now, Andy? You can indeed, Joe. All right, so mine's sort of on a similar theme, Frank, because obviously at the start of your presentation, you talked about this report, the AD Little report. And yeah. Was, was that produced because, like, something terrible happened and then you had a report and then it was a plan to write, now you have to get all these crossings closed? Absolutely, yeah. We had um, we had a, a derailment on our aging railway and it was... 50 kg with timber sleepers and it was in poor, poor condition through lack of um, funding over the years. So the, the, that particular accident kicked off the um, the AD Little uh, risk model being introduced by the company and uh, basically all our level crossings were surveyed, inspected and then scored. And uh, in, in, then AD Little, Little turned into Satira Risk Solutions because the, the, that particular model I suppose over since 1997, the model in a level crossing risk had sort of advanced significantly so much that the data supporting Eddie Litton was likely to have been out of date. So um, we went to the marketplace and in conjunction with Satira Risk Solutions, um, we designed our, our current level crossing risk model, which we've been using since. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ian, I see you have your hand up. Have you got another question? It's probably not gone back down yet. I'm probably there. Sorry there, oh, Andy. OK, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, just one more thing. Um, Frank, in light of a lot of the, the rail slip, the earth slippages and, and, you know, weather events that we're seeing at the moment, is that something that you're looking at, how you monitor some of those those areas for flood or for slip? Yeah, we, we also have this. this is, I, I've spoken about our level crossing risk model, but we also have an earthworks risk model as well. So all our inspections feed back into that and we have categorized all our different types of earthworks based and we look at things like um, rainfall, weather forecast, predictive forecasting and stuff like that. And uh, we would have looked at all our highest risk assets and um, 
put the proper mitigations in place and improvements where possible. Um, they're not, we're not, we're not a hundred percent perfect, but we're getting there. We're definitely conscious of them. We're using all the latest technology available to us, remote monitoring and things like that, to um, to hopefully um, stay ahead of the 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 eight ball, as they say, or the cue ball. But um, yeah, our level crossing risk model for Earthworks is, is really uh, beneficial from there and helping us. And again, we're all the time keeping that up to date with the latest trends in weather and global warming and um, vegetation control. And, you know, um, again, they're, they're inspected um, between three and six years, depending on their classification. And uh, so we're, we're, we, we, we're fortunate enough we haven't had many but we 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 have had some uh f during the freak weather we'll call it where just water had to basically wash out some some of the track in certain mm -hmm. locations but we were always fortunate enough that we were it was reported to us before a train um yeah. arrived on scene no, that's all right. thank you for your answer OK, we've got a supplementary to Ian Ross's cross question from Adam Williams, and he said, be interested to know if the, this is the level crossing closures on the lines that were under care and maintenance are actually included in the figure of closures. Yeah. Um, all the those level crossings that, that we have reported and were all on live uh, operational track and um they 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 wouldn't they wouldn't include our engineers sidings or any disused level crossings right. they they still technically lie on our books but they're down they're disused tracks so they're there but they're not we we yeah. don't maintain them or we don't actively do anything around them right yeah so the risk is gone because the trains have gone yeah yeah okay right any more we, sorry yeah. Now, I, again, I'm going to apologise. I threw out an awful lot of information there and I skipped over a lot of text. I didn't want to bore you with text either. But if, as I said, you're more than welcome to email me directly and I'll try and get you more facts and figures and give you more information if anyone requires it. Okay. As I said, I, I was just conscious that we had a short period of time there. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. All right, have we any more questions before I look to wind the meeting up? Right, so no more questions have come in now. So um, I'd like to thank you very much, Frank, for that fascinating presentation. And there's certainly food for thought in there about um, um, it's like the situation in 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 Britain. It's um, we have a huge number of crossings, and um, that is a real challenge in 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 managing them safely. And particularly as we seem to be getting increasing users of remote crossings and things like that, where yeah, the, the, the potential user is the first time they've ever encountered a level crossing, which requires you to open the gates and speak to the signal or whatever. So I think it's very pertinent to that. So I'd like to um, everyone to join me in uh, thanking us. If you unmute yourselves and we'll thank our speaker in the usual way. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, cheers, Frank. Thank you. It was brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Andy.